Good evening. Good evening. I'm Dan Lieberman, and uh, welcome to Discovering Us, Great Discoveries in Human Origins. 
so I'm a professor at, uh, human, of human evolutionary biology at Harvard University and a member of the Science Executive Committee at the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human origins research and sharing discoveries. Discoveries. I'm also the author of several popular books, including The Story of the Human Body, and most recently, Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our collaborator in this program, Smithsonian Enterprises, and our generous sponsors, the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund. And if you're watching this episode live, please post comments or questions in the chat, and we will get, do our best to answer them during the program. And now Leakey Foundation President Jeannie Newman will say a few words about tonight's program. Thank you. I am Jean Newman, the president of the Leakey Foundation, and I'm delighted to introduce our special guest this evening, Evan Haddingham. He is an award-winning science writer and senior editor for the PBS series, Nova. His most recent book is a project with the Leakey Foundation titled, Discovering Us, 50 Great Discoveries of Human Origins. Tonight, we will explore highlights from the book and hear the stories behind some of the most interesting and important discoveries of the past 50 years. It's been an honor to work with such a gifted and passionate science writer. And now, Evan Hanningham will join Dr. Dan Lieberman in conversation. Hello, Dan. Great. Hello, Evan. So <laughs> as we get started, let me just first say how much I enjoyed the book. It's just terrific. It's, um, it's, it's, it's beautifully written, and and it's and one of the things that's fun about it is that you've taken all these wonderful stories about human evolution, and so they're all interesting, great stories. Um, and and but 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 in doing so, you've added a lot of wonderful, interesting, and important science. So it's like reading all the really exciting stuff in human evolution without any of the boring sort of filler that sometimes you get in a lot of other books. So so congratulations on a really terrific book. Well, thanks, Dan. We're off to a good start here. <laughs> so so um, so. I guess really the first question is what what for you uh, what's the purpose of this book uh, and and also why do you think you know people should read it? Well, the mission of the book, um, which is really the brainchild of uh, Leahy Foundation President Camilla Smith, of course, um, was to celebrate a half century of discoveries of uh, our fossil ancestors in the field and of uh, in the the long term observations of primates that is uh, you know the core of what the leaky foundation does but at the same time and and during those 50 years of course this is a science that has been utterly transformed revolutionized by new techniques so it, it, it's as much um, a story about science undergoing transformation and really changing our perspectives on where our ancestors came from um, as well as that celebration of milestones in the science, uh, it was very important to highlight the new generation of emerging researchers, which is, of course, another piece of uh, that the Leakey Foundation um, uh, does uh, through its Baldwin Fellowship and uh, its uh, Brown Scholarship. Um, because, again, just as the science is being transformed, so is the cast of people that is doing it. And now, um, we have, through these programs that the, the foundation supports, um, we have uh, aspiring scholars from Africa who are able to get advanced degrees that might not be available in their, their home countries. But the idea is to get those qualifications and they will then return and build institutional capabilities for the first time in, um, in African nations. Instead of having outsiders come in and do their heritage and their ancient past for them, which has been the model for so many years. You know, it's, it's been scientific colonialism one way or another for, for decades. And we just feel that these are two very important aspects of this story that, that we needed to bring out in the book. Yeah, I'd say I agree completely. I mean, one of the things I can say as, as being on the Science Executive Committee is that I, I, we all, we, I mean, the, the most enjoyable meeting of the year is always when we do the, the Baldwin fellowships to provide yeah. fellowships for, for, for scholars from, from, from these countries. And, and it's just such a joy and a pleasure. And, and it's amazing how much the, the Leakey Foundation uh, supports, uh, supports this endeavor. So I completely agree with you. But I also have to say, 
the book is really remarkably inclusive, not only in terms of you know bringing in the younger generations, but also I was very impressed by just how much you know really up to date modern science. I mean, you even get to CRISPR and all kinds of other new technologies, and and uh, you know it's really an incredible swath of 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 different techniques and methods and discoveries that you um, that you uh, you managed to weave together, and all all in the context of really really enjoyable stories. So again, I urge. If you haven't read read the book, folks, I urge you to read it. Um, so let me ask another question, which is, you know, what drew you to to this project? It's a pretty big project, you know, uh, picking fifty of the you know big discoveries and 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 um, and really kind of helping uh, readers understand them. Um, I was drawn to it uh, naturally because of um, a lifetime's fascination in archaeology and uh, the ancient past, um, which my my job at WGBH Nova as the senior science editor has kind of supported this habit because it turns out that stories about our remote origins are incredibly popular with our viewers. You know, it's like our, our cosmology or physics shows, these, these shows that ask really big questions that tackle, you know, these kind of ultimate mysteries and certainly the mystery of of our ancestors and how they evolved is is right up there, and um, over my decades, <laughs> nearly three decades now at Nova, it's it's incredible to think of it. Anyway, we, we did several landmark programs on on that subject, um, and just to name a couple, I mean, we began in 1994 with In Search of Human Origins with Dan Johan uh, Don Johansson which was, of course, the, the iconic story of Lucy and its implications for evolution. And um, then uh, um, uh, after that, there was a, a show, a three-parter again uh, in 2009 called Becoming Human. Um, an interesting challenge with all these shows, uh, partly the logistics of shooting in these remote areas, of course, and getting the story, but it's also how do you represent ancient ancestors. And um, uh, I have a, a favorite collection of really bad reenactments of ancient ancient humans. I should really have brought some clips because they're very entertaining. Anyway, in, uh, in our first series in search of human origins, it was human actors in ape suits shot from uh, a, a tastefully done from a considerable distance. So just conveying the sense of general atmosphere and not being too explicit. In the 2009 show, the computer graphics had come along, and this was an initial uh, uh, step in doing motion graphics. And um, they were pretty cool at the time. They look absolutely awful now because <laughs> was part of animation <laughs> has, uh, has uh, you know, progressed uh, far beyond that. We did a two-part, very popular um, um, two-part special um, called The Great Human Odyssey, done by the very gifted Canadian anthropologist and producer, Niobe Thompson. And that was all about the spread of modern humans around the world. So there wasn't a problem in representing ancestors. And Niobe took the interesting tack of uh, filming in remote places and asking indigenous people uh, if they would mind uh, participating in, um, you know, in, in scenes that would evoke their ancestral past. Um, it's treading a, treading a difficult line there. Um, in general now, when we tackle this kind of subject, we really say that less, less is more. That if you are too explicit with showing this kind of stuff, you risk it's called the Monty Python factor or, the, or generally producing something cheesy. Now, I, I say that that's just one of the kind of challenges. There are other challenges, of course, which is telling complex science in a dramatic form in a story that people will understand and Nova believes in explaining process. And those, those principles have kind of stayed with me and informed the way, and informed the way I wrote this book. I mean, um, the, the principles of storytelling have always been that they go back to the days of, of Homer, you know, and we apply those kind of simple rules to every Nova show. And I applied them to all the stories in this book too. Um, first, you need to have a, a big idea, a big question at the beginning, a, a hook to, to um, ask your reader or viewer, you know, why should, why should you be interested or get engaged in the, next, in the next hour or in the next 
a thousand words, and then you have to to make it make the basics of it explainable, and the how do we know part, and then there obviously has to be a challenge that is overcome here in terms of understanding or advancing knowledge, and so I, I really thought of each of these stories as kind of a mini nova that had to accomplish the same things that we use in in our programs. It's interesting you say that because I very much had that sense that um, that each of the stories, each of the sections, you kind of set the stage and you give the you give the reader a kind of um, uh, you know a sense of what it's like. You know, you you kind of they enter into the story. I, it was a it's a it's 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 a it's a it's an excellent journalistic uh, technique, and I think it's a it's very effective. So so I mean, I as a kid grew up watching Nova. I mean, I remember it was to be on, I think it was Wednesday nights at eight or something like that when I was a child. But um, uh, and I think Nova certainly had a a huge effect on 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 my interest in becoming a scientist and 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 studying uh, human origins. But uh, you know, what got you interested in the subject? What did what did it did it start with Nova or, or or did you become interested in in this topic uh, beforehand? Well, I, uh, archaeology was my my thing really initially, and um, that went back to a school bus trip at an impression when I was at an impressionable age of seventeen. Um, attending a grammar school in South London, and the, the the bus pulled into the village of Avery in southwest England, which um, is an extraordinary place. It's a medieval village, a quaint little village that's set inside Europe's biggest stone circle, and uh, which features um, dozens of stones weighing up to 25 tons. It's about 20 miles north of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is unique and wonderful, but it's a bit overrun. And there was something about Avery that was, and still is, deeply mysterious to me. And I remember walking into the, the village museum and buying a pamphlet, expecting it to tell me what went on there. And uh, understandably, this pamphlet said, um, nobody is really sure, or I'm paraphrasing, nobody, nobody is really sure what this place was for. And that did it, that absolutely did it. That was a moment in which uh, I was completely hooked and that led to um, my first book for general audience about, about archaeology. And in my 20s and 30s, I alternated between writing these, uh, these books and doing um, archaeological field work, uh, just, just laboring in the field, uh, which, I, which I loved. And uh, I eventually did a, uh, a one-year master's in prehistory and archaeology at Sheffield University to ground myself a little bit. But um, the second really um, life-changing moment for me, I think, was when I volunteered on a Ice Age um, cave site in southwest France, where the, uh, the Ice Age hunters, hunter-gatherers who occupied the place, um, made, a, made temporary camps in the entrance to this cave. And we didn't know at the time, but apparently they did this for on and off seasonally uh, to exploit the local fauna um, for something like 100,000 years. And we were delving into these layers and unearthing the tools, the scraps, the bits and pieces and the bones that were left behind. Um, the humans, the ancient humans, lived in this front part of the cave in semi-daylight but sheltered. But... The back of the cave held a secret, and it narrowed to uh, a little tiny foxhole. And one day, after a more than usually huge five-course lunch and siesta, <laughs> um, Monsieur Caminard, the stockily built uh, landowner, led us down into into this hole in hole, dark hole, the back of the cave. And he went down on all fours, crawling like this down to this narrow, plunging tunnel. And we followed after him. And you emerge in a room not much bigger than a, a tennis court and not imposing at all. In fact, if you stood up, with, with, if you're not careful, you banged your head against the stalactites. But in one corner of the cave, in, on one wall, there were these images of uh, uh, stencil hands that were left behind by Ice Age people. And when I say um, stencil hands, what I mean is that they would hold their hands up against the wall, yeah. right? And using uh, a nat pigment made from natural materials, uh, probably hematite or red ochre, which is commonly found, 
they would either you know fill their mouths up and, and spit the paint out or it's possible that they used a hollow bone as a kind of a spraying device well the current thinking about these type, type of representations this is the earliest phase now it's believed of cave art and those hands could have been about 30 to, or 32,000 years old. Now, this is something to think about. I, the, 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 the master pinnacle of Ice Age art, Lascaux, that we're, we're very familiar with through, through uh, the, the pictures of its dramatic paintings, was probably dates to, well, the dates have shifted around, but it's 16 to 18,000, something like that. So this is a mind boggling thought. The same amount of time separates us from the Lasco painters, as separated separated the Lasco painters, possibly, <laughs> from these people that left their hands in, behind. And when you see this yourself, when you're with a hands outstretched outstretched distance of an image that uh, another human has left so far back in time, it's thrilling. It's a very emotional experience. You wonder what was going on in the heads of those people back then. Yeah. And that was a moment that led me to become really interested in the question of, of human origins and what, what, what went through the heads and the bodies and how did we evolve, all the big questions that we tried to do in the book. Yeah, yeah. And I can really relate to that. I had similar experiences and, and it, uh, it really is, um, it's really just extraordinary to have those those opportunities to kind of have a connection with the past and make you wonder, you know, why are we here and how did we yes. get this way? It's, uh, these are great timeless questions. And and one of the things that's fun about the book is that you you you, you tackle quite a, quite a few of these big questions. And so I, and it, you know, I remember there were some discussions when this book was beginning to be formulated about you know how you're going to pick pick fifty stories. And so like, you know, what were how did you pick? which 50 to do and you know what were the biggest challenges of of trying to of trying to of trying to sort of narrow down and 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 tackle these these 50 you know major stories well i have to say uh several things here first of all not every story worked a few <laughs> i wrote <laughs> and and uh ended up in the trash um a important criterion again going back to these rules of storytelling they had to be not just big discoveries but good stories in themselves. And again, through my work at GBH, I've had the, you know, the, the privilege of a lot of training in that area uh, and a lot of experience. But I, I want to say, first of all, that this is not just my doing this book, that it is very, it takes a village, you know, and um, uh, I had the Science Executive Council to draw on and you, Dan, <laughs> of which you are a distinguished member. And so at any time, you know, there was really expert advice to call upon, which and it was that part aspect of the, of the story of, of the of the whole job was fascinating, as was getting input from so many others, you know, people like Don Johansson of the Institute of Human Origins and the late Bill Kimball at, at, at that institution that uh, that made, you know, important contributions. And um, uh that, that that really helped in the, the selection process, let's put it that way. Um, a bigger issue was, oh, one thing is, is that one challenge when I started out, I had absolutely zero knowledge about primatology. I mean, I knew nothing. And the reason is that NOVA doesn't do shows on it. That's left to the PBS Nature series, right? And we simply, don't, we've done maybe a few exceptional ones, but in general, that's true. And so I came in with this prejudice that, well, viewers really love, the, or readers will really love the mystique around ancient fossils, the, the, the detective work that goes in looking at bones and, you know, trying to read the evidence uh, using all these new technologies. Primates, I thought, well, you know, they're it's kind of all the same kind of story isn't it boy was i wrong when i went into it i decided that pr the primatology stories were actually the richest and, and and more interesting and exciting than a lot of the fossil stories and that's because of course it involves the incredible dedication of these researchers out in the field who um just go through extraordinary conditions in the field i think of the orangutan 
uh, <laughs> field work is the worst of the lot where you're oh, yeah. Cheryl not running around trying to correct orangutan P under trees, right? Yeah, yeah right. thank you. Yes, this is Cheryl Knott of Boston <laughs> University who pioneered this uh, extraordinary research <laughs> campaign where you get up and now her pro or um, her uh, 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 colleague Erin Vogel, supported by the Leakey Foundation, who is continuing this work in the field. And they have to get up at 3.30 a.m. every morning in Borneo and Sumatra and um, trek out through knee-deep swamp water to where they think the orangutan nest was the night before, if they got it straight. And once they locate it, they have to wait for the orangutans in their nest to rouse themselves. And these are very solitary creatures, I should have added. It's not like, you know, there's a whole mass of them. These are very, you know, just tiny, tiny little family get groups, I guess. Anyway, the, the orangutans get up and they and they pee. And that pee is the vital new tool for analyzing the hormones that uh, control the fertility cycle of orangutans, which is one of the great mysteries in primate evolution, because they have the longest fertility cycle, uh, the longest interval between births, seven to nine years, of any mammal. Yeah. And why is that so? And now here's a classic good story. You see, you've got a mystery and um, extraordinary bit of science process. I mean, this is a dream for a storytelling. To, and, and, to... What, and what Cheryl showed, it was all about energy. But I also th yeah. thought the primate stories really, I mean, some of them were, I, I mean, for example, I particularly enjoyed reading about uh, Susan Perry's uh, capuchins who stick their fingers in each other's eyes. I mean, there's, I have to say, I agree with you. The primate stories are, are, are riveting. And, and, you know, because there's, in addition to the researchers, the primates themselves are fascinating and, you know, they're living creatures. And uh... Well, the great revelation to me was the, not only the, was the immense diversity, let's say, sure. that exists among prime, amongst primate behavior and amongst their social structure, how many different ways that these societies have found to, uh, to handle violence or coexist with one another or deal with outsiders or rivals. And you get everything from the uh, wildly competitive um, and and stressful society of, of baboons in Kenya, uh, as, as has been studied for nearly 50 years at Amboseli with that amazing project, um, uh, to which reminds one of, of the you know the stresses of corporate corporate life on Wall Street in terms of oh. and and the fascinating case study there is how um, trauma uh, and hardship gets passed on and affects the survival rate of the, inf the baboon infants. It's a very fascinating yeah. story that tr just as in human societies, trauma gets visited on the next gener on, yeah. on infants and on the next generation. Same is true of baboon society. And then you turn to uh, bonobos who are the original, um, no, this is a terrible cliche. I was gonna say the original hippies, that's, that's not true, but I mean, uh, in, in incredible contrast to male-dominated, uh, aggressive world of chimps, here bonobos have a society that where the, um, the, the, the power is essentially in the hands of females who make alliances both within their, uh, their home ground and, and with powerful um, females in other groups right outside their territories. It's a fascinating contrast because chimps will defend their territory to the, to the death and here you have these um extraordinary um bonobo females who well they're by contrast um they're remarkable for the way in which they uh, are much more peaceable and have found ways to uh to sure uh, you know to 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 sure when, when get along peaceably let's put it that way yeah, when two bonobo groups encounter each other, and so yeah. unlike chimpanzees, will just go to war. Yeah, exactly. They'll, they'll have a party. It's amazing. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, I think that one of the fun things about the book, I mean, going along this theme, is that you you tackle uh, throughout the book. You know, you kind of weave into these these stories. Um, you you kind of disabuse a, a number of myths, um, and um, and I, I wonder which which of the biggest myths you think you think uh, you enjoyed. Uh, slaying oh that's easy my favorite one you see i was puzzling right at the start of this project how do i unify these 50 stories i mean i can write all these little individual stories but this needs an introduction 
that kind of clues in the the casual reader into you know this whole field this whole domain of thinking about human origins and um what's a, a way to do that and uh, my eye fell not for the first time <laughs> on the leaky foundation's own logo which has this iconic image of the march of progress exactly yeah well, this is the long version of it. The, the Leaky Foundation logo is a little is an abbreviated version of it. And um, it's, it's an image that immediately says human origins. Everybody's familiar with this. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, the, the bi late biologist, uh, had this lovely quote saying, this is the canonical rep uh, representation of, of evolution. The one picture in, uh, immediately grasped and viscerally understood by all. And so we all understand that, that, that this is a, you know, you, you start off with a uh, an early primate ancestor on the left hand side, and you work your way up, and there's there's us, <laughs> modern humans up there, and this suggests an, an inexorable single line of progress. Um, that you know, it, it, it's us that our humanity was somehow special, um, that and that it went far back into the past. Um, there's a slight bump in the road here because the lineup towards the end um, includes a, uh, a Neanderthal, and we know that they went extinct. And uh, in fact, the original illustrator had misgivings, a, a, a gifted artist called Rudolf Zallinger. This is in 1965 for a Time Life book. They had this beautiful fold out image that I remember uh, looking at as a kid. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it was enormously influential. But the artist at the time thought, hmm, and actually went to his editor and said, isn't this a bit of a simplification of the, the human story? And the editor said, mm, maybe, but the, the readers are going to love this. And uh, so it's stuck with us ever since. Well, doesn't it really and, go back to the, um, to the, um, to the, to the figure that, um, that Huxley produced, right? In, in the, um, because Huxley also did a little lineup. Of course, he didn't. Yeah, have profile. Possible. That was comparing. Was apes. Yeah. Yeah, that was comparing apes in Africa. Yeah. And modern humans to show their anatomical similarity, and that was a very important thing that helped persuade Darwin that our origins lay lay in Africa. You yeah. know, so that was an important step. But um, and that this this image of our human specialness, there was something about the package that we evolved that was unstoppable at an early age, that somehow at, all at the same time or at such a uh, part of the single package, let's say, we got our big brains, the ability to make tools, fire. We had this culture, this elaborate social, uh, a more elaborate social world than primates, that, that, that this made us uh, a hugely powerful force and that we drove all our other competitors into extinction. Um, and that we were essentially kind of alone on the stage for a long period of our ancestry. Now, that has been transformed, and it's ancient DNA, of course, that, that has done it and revealed that uh, at any one stage in our evolution, the stage, we weren't on this alone on the stage. It was crowded <laughs> with these other forms of humanity that were only, that were still just in the last 15 years in this amazing phase of discovery. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, one of the things that I also enjoyed about the book is you really wove in a lot of a lot of uh, the evidence from from the, the molecular evidence and especially the the the, the, the ancient DNA evidence. And uh, so, uh, of those, uh, which were your your favorite um, you know uh, chapters about about the impact that DNA has made on on our, our understanding of human origins? That's a pretty easy one because the the Denisovan. I'm never sure if that's how you pronounce it, whether it's Denisovan or Denisovan. I hear, um, I hear both. Right. So uh, the existence of this branch of humanity was only discovered in 2010, when the DNA was sequenced from a minute bone. Do we have the picture of that? There we go. Yes, yeah. This this is a tiny pinky bone. You can see it's resting on the pinky finger of this of this modern human <laughs> there. And when they extracted that bone, to their amazement, they found it contained more. Seventy percent uh, of the bone was ancient DNA. More of it than in any other previous sample. 
and it bore no relationship to any to the Neanderthal DNA that had been sequenced that same year. Um, and it was different from our own DNA, of course, because it was an ancestor. This is found in a cave in Siberia, uh, probably dating back to about 60,000 years or so. And so um, th this set off a quest to find out, well, OK, we got this unknown branch in, in the middle in Siberia. How far did they extend? And they then looked at modern DNA and started analyzing can we find this sequence of Denisovan DNA cropping up anywhere else? Well, what do you know? It was over not just a huge area of Asia, but all the way, the highest proportions of it were in um, Indonesia and... Uh, and uh, Melanesia. Yeah, right. And that's because the Denisovans had uh, interbred with descendants who carried those, so those genes survive to our, our present day. Um, but it was still known from just this handful of bones from the Siberian site. The next most bizarre chapter, which I really love, is that goes you, you uh, do a flashback to 1980 on the, um, the, the edges of the high plateau of Tibet. And a uh, saffron cloaked monk goes into Bashia cave at 11,000 feet to meditate. And just as he's getting zenned out, he happens to look down and pulls out of the dirt a humongous jaw, jawbone, with two massive teeth, massive molar teeth, about twice the size of our own. Um, and he, he took it down and ended up in a Chinese museum, in a drawer in a Chinese museum. Um, and there was no DNA in it. But thanks to a technique that was um, supported by the Leakey Foundation in its development, they were able to uh, identify the protein structure. And the protein structure in this jaw labeled it as a Denisovan bone. Okay, Now, we're 1,000 kilometers or more from Denise, from Siberia in the cave. And here is this really hefty looking uh, uh, ancestor um, up here at high altitude. And you have to look at, I'm sorry, uh, I, I could carry on for another half hour about this story. Um, there's a wonderful element in it, in that the, the, uh, um, the Denisovan DNA also carried a, uh, a special gene in it that even today confers the ability to offset mountain sickness, which is a terrible problem of living at altitude. E pass one. E pass one. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, yeah. That's and so that's story. it's a story that's amazing. But look, here's we're in a in an age where another ghost population in Asia. This blows my mind. They, they didn't look at DNA. They did big data AI analysis of uh, of genetic modern genetic material and identified a ghost population that interbred with Denisovan the Denisovans and with Neanderthals, um, and now. You don't even need bones. You don't even need DNA. You can do, you, use data. But you, now they can do the soil. They can go to a, a site, a cave site, where there is good stratification of the layers. Fossils are very hard to come by. But the, the traces of human DNA are now recoverable, just left by human occupation um, in those layers. So they can be dated. And so you can identify people by these kind of ghostly traces that they, they left behind. And this yeah. all happened in the last 10, oh, 15 years. It's amazing. You know? Yeah, I know, it's super exciting. And we can also now take those genes and put them into mice and see how they get expressed. And I mean, the, 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 the discoveries are, are super exciting. And I, you know, it makes me wonder, because you, you know, at the beginning of the book, you have this lovely um, sort of history of the leakies and, and, um, and how, you know, uh, and the contributions of Lewis and Mary Leakey. And, and that, you know, one of the things I always wonder is, you know, what would they have thought, uh, especially Lewis, who, uh, who, who, I mean, Mary, Mary Leakey lived longer than Lewis Leakey into the yeah. genetic age, but imagine what he would have, how much he would have enjoyed um, learning about the, the, the genetic evidence that we now have. Yes. And my immediate thought is that he would have feel really thrilled to see how, the bet that he took on 
sending he was the first to come up with the idea of the long-term observations of primates in, in the wild and he had an, this instinctive and um somewhat sexist idea uh that women would be better observers and uh more capable i mean uh maybe that's the wrong term and uh, i shouldn't be calling him that but um his his belief was that uh women were patient, careful observers. And so he recruited his famous trimates, these three great pioneers of long-term observations. And um, uh, that, uh, that's Jane Goodall, of course, in, in the center with uh, Diane Fossey on the right, who pioneered the gorilla, um, long-term gorilla studies at Karasoki in uh, what's currently the DRC. And to the left, uh, Baruti Mar Mary Galdikas, who um, led, the, led the way into this difficult and thankless job of um, studying orangutans. Um, and each of these three figures in their way really uh, were, is one of the most substantial legacies that Lewis left with us. Now, there was many other things. I mean, Mary herself, uh, Lewis was the showman, the enthusiast, the who could charm an audience you know he, he could he could spin tales like nobody else and was uh really instrumental besides the discoveries that he and mary made in getting human origins understood and popularized thanks to national geographic magazine and other places but it was mary who was the really great scientist who had the methodical keen mind and for example in her publications of the sites of Olivier Gorge that she spent toiled for years making. She assembled all this data that is still being used today by uh, paleoanthropologists. Absolutely. To, 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 they can take this data and come up with new hypotheses and test them about the function of the living floors that Lewis and Mary found at Olivier Gorge, living floors that were left behind by these, uh, these early hominins. You know, she was a she was a, a, a one of the great scientists of all times. There's no question about it. And I, she also person. she also found the famous footprints at at Lytoli, which uh, were probably left behind by this. Uh, if you've been to the American Museum of Natural History, there's this lovely diorama of a stuffed, I'm going to say a stuffed Lucy, <laughs> a stuffed Australop. No, a well, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a there's a Mr. and Mrs. Lucy walking. That's right, somewhere. hand in hand. It's a romantic there's image. Somewhere. Yeah, it's a little bit paternalistic too, though. Yes, yes. He's got the guy's got his hand around around the. Around That's right. The female That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but, if, but you know you can go visit those 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 yeah. uh, footprints in in Tanzania, and I hope people get a chance to visit at the edge of the Serengeti Plain. And they're very important, of course, because they're the oldest footprints known at three point eight million, and they they show without a doubt that the modern human habitual bipedalism was well established by that that very early date so they're very important um but another one of those mind-boggling developments that made me having to to keep rewriting these stories just when i thought i'd finished them oh dear something else came along well this one the book has been out fortunately <laughs> but this amazing development came just in december um where they they uncovered tracks that at Lytoli that had previously been attributed to a bear walking on its hind legs, which seems a, just a little improbable, right? That, that there was a circus think, bear. I don't think the bear hypothesis was ever taken that seriously. Oh, good. <laughs> but anyway, they, they study these and they, they uh, after a lot of very ingenious analysis that included getting a performing bear, I guess, on a treadmill making, or, or not treadmill, but you know, with a, a sand a, pile. A sand pit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they replicated. They got somehow they induced this bear to stand up, and and they could compare the imprint in the lab with what had been photographed in the field, and they decided it was another unknown species of of uh, of human ancestor walking. Now we don't know. My my fantasy here is that Mr. and Mrs. Lucy, uh, pardon the expression, were, were walking along. And then they look casually over to their left and wave to this other species of human. Now, we don't know that this happened, of course, simultaneously. It's very unlikely indeed. But um, 
thrilling discoveries are happening all the time. That's the point I, of this I story. So far, there are only two of those footprints. So, so. Oh yes. <laughs> Time will tell what uh, exactly. what we learn from them, but it is it's always interesting. And the and and I also have to say one just on the subject of Laetoli, I was so pleased that you mentioned my favorite fact about the Laetoli footprints, which is they were discovered when when Mary Leakey's team crew were throwing dung patties at each other. So uh, whatever it takes, you know, because you know people have fun in the field, and sometimes fun leads they to do. great discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, so. So you, you clearly have a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of these stories. Um, what was the most fun to write? Well, I mean, when you, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's such good stories. I think I had the most fun with the, the, the cooking story on the whole, which was all about the origins of cooked food and, uh, you know, Richard Wrangham's groundbreaking uh, mm -hmm. uh, work on, you know, the difference that it makes made in the evolution of our metabolism to have cooked food versus raw food. It's just a very fundamental step in our evolution that released all this energy that was essential for us to, to, uh, to get our, to power our enlarged brains. And, and uh, that discovery, that basic mastery of fire and uh, of extracting energy efficiently out of food was really fundamental. But when I read that, um, uh, uh, Richard Brangham wrote some lovely semi-humorous stuff about how awful uh, a chimp diet is, and he tried to to subsist off it himself for a very brief time. Um, and, and there, it's just started to turn into a humorous story to me. And uh, um, the book's only good joke I buried I buried in that one, which I won't I won't probably won't drag out in front of you. Um, but cooking, we all relate to. It seems. Well, it's like Dan running. Okay, running is a part of our of our lives. We kind of take it for granted. I mean, my my preferred sport is swimming, but when the pool's closed, I'll go for a jog happily. I mean, uh, we know we can run fast. What we don't know, we don't. What we don't appreciate is what an important role this play in evolution, which your work with your colleague Dennis Bramble really, really brought out. And this was the type of story that immediately appealed to me because, this, you know, something in our everyday lives that turns out to have a much bigger importance and significance in our in our evolution. And by the way, there was a lovely hook to it, the opening line that, that this research that you did, it started with a pig on a treadmill. Which is now, true. You know, <laughs> that's a gift to a writer, an opening line like that. Well, well, I'll, shut up. I'll shut up, Dan, and you, you, you tell me why running was so important in evolution and, and the role that it played. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's true that we did start with the pig on a treadmill, but of course, the, the real, you know, real reason we think it's important is that that's how we became hunters. It's hard to be a hunter if you can't run, you know, and uh, I mean, we're, when you're a weak, small, little, pathetic creature like a like an early homo, how are you going to get dinner, right? So without 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 running it down. So um so you also have, of course, you cover a ton of fossils in the in the in the book, and of course, you know we all love fossils. Um, and um, you know I, we should probably break soon for for questions because I'm sure there are tons of questions. But but very briefly, you know, um, what were your favorite? You know, if there's any like highlight fossils that people should zoom to, which ones? Boy, um, well, my favorite story truthfully in here that continues to haunt me is the um the the tiny well not that tiny they were five foot tall but the vulnerable um humans that were found at the site called demonisi in the caucasus and these represent the oldest uh homo fossils of the, of the homo um uh the the, the homo uh, family to have emerged from Africa. And this was about 1.8 million years ago, something like that. Yep, yep exactly. And um, they found, it's an, it's an amazing story because uh, this is at a, a crossroads in the Silk Road in the middle of the Caucasus in Central Europe, um, 4,000 miles from Africa. And this is where the first evidence of, um, of Homo leaving Africa shows up. And for various reasons, we inherited the expectation that, um, that to leave Africa, 
you needed a relatively modern body frame, you needed cooked food, you needed uh, developed tools, um, an athletic build and all the rest of it. And these were puny little, uh, little relatively puny humans weighing about 100 pounds. This is a nasty place they, they were in because there were giant predators uh, all around, um, uh, European jaguars, hot, large hyenas, saber-toothed tigers. And so far, they've dug in this site, and they've not found any evidence of fire. Um, so, and their tools are utterly primitive, just smashed cobbles. And we thought it took a more advanced technology of hand axes, a, a much more refined type of tool, to make it possible to, you know, to, to trailblaze your way out of Africa. But no, these, these little guys were essentially lobbing river cobbles hopefully, <laughs> at these nasty predators. And we're not talking about the relatively temperate climate of, of, uh, of yeah. uh, East yeah. Africa. We're talking about a chilly winters in the Caucasus, and they're eating raw food with no fire. Some of them without teeth. And some of them without, they had terrible yeah. dental exactly. problems. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so they had, they had the, the dental problems speak to poor health generally. Um, wildly varying skulls, uh, tiny brain capacities, you know, a third to a half that of a modern human. Um, so again, what kind of mind or brain is functioning here is, is a tantalizing question. And one of the five was a somewhat elderly specimen that uh, had just one tooth in its jaw, but that diseased tooth had been there for a couple of years and the bone had grown back. So this led the archeologists to speculate, well, this person could not chew at all properly. And perhaps he was being looked after. He could not have survived that long. This is the argument. He could not have survived that long without being cared for by the rest of this uh, beleaguered community of ancestors. Although recently now, no, no, no one will know if that's really true or not. Yeah. Uh, if it's true, it's the oldest evidence for human care for the, the challenged, uh, for, for some person with disabilities. So yeah. we'd all love to believe it is true. But there are so many stories in human evolution that we would love to be true and that have, don't always stand the test of time. Yeah, recently uh, uh, Martin Serbeck published a, an edentulous uh, bonobo that survived a long time without, without uh, so, oh. so anyway, yeah. you, what, what, how that, Quite relates to the Dominici skull. Um, we don't know, but I want to ask one last question because we sure. do want to get 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 a yeah, sure. chance for for folks to 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 ask questions. But my the last question really is, you know, the book really is about about the past and discoveries about the past. But but of course we're in a in a really um, you know challenging time with not just a pandemic, but we're you know facing all kinds of you know, social uh, stress and political dysfunction and climate change and and you know what lessons do you think, for those of us who are, 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 are thinking about the future, but also reading about the past? What lessons do you think the, the book has, um, and these stories have for thinking about our our species' future? Well, that's <laughs> excuse me. That's, <laughs> that is that is the ultimate question. I pondered that. Uh, you know how to wrap this thing up. Well, the lessons to me are clear: that humans are a very adaptable species. Um, we spread to every corner of the globe and adapted to all manner of climates and ways of life and subsistence and, and, uh, and environments. And so we're, we're very resilient species. In fact, you know, it's been argued that um, one thing that may explain a lot of human adaptations is that, we, uh, that key stages of it happened with the Australopithecines like Lucy during the interval of time, you know, uh, from from four million to two million, when there were large climate swings in in Africa, and our ability to withstand those swings, it's argued, is uh, w one thing that made us humans. And uh, what's different, however, with our present situation is that I think the lessons of archaeology, not human evolution, are really instructive to answering this, because archaeology, operating on a much smaller time scale. Tell, tells us that complex social orders, when they come under stress from drought or and, uh, other kinds of natural disasters, but 
but environmental problems, let's put it that way, are very prone to collapse. It doesn't mean that people and communities disappear necessarily. And let's think about, um, uh, for example, the Maya, the ancient Maya or, or Angor, where you have these really, really highly developed uh, hierarchical societies um, that, that ultimately collapsed because of a, some major shift due to drought. And that's the, the different situation that we're in now. It's, we, you know, we live in this incredibly uh, precariously balanced, complex technical world. And, you know, we're faced by uh, things. It doesn't mean that humans are going to become extinct, I don't think, but all that's rough. Um, but a more, but the, there is serious, tr serious challenges ahead, I think it would be obvious to say <laughs> from that perspective. Well, we could go on for hours. We could. <laughs> Maybe we will, but, um, but, but I really do want to get to uh, some of the questions that are, um, that are, they're streaming in. So, um, uh, so the first question is from our our Leaky, um, our former Leaky Foundation president, Camilla Smith, and she she asks: Since the story of Homo is much more bushy than a straight line march, what kind of illustration would indicate this conclusion? What might, what might make the il illustration iconic as iconic as the the March of Progress one is? Well, C Camilla, I think you mentioned it. It's the bush. I mean, uh, or the other image that's been used a lot is that of a braided stream where you get, um, you know, a, a channel, a channel that splits up and uh, flows apart and then joins together again. And, and we're finding this out that our ancestral um, paths were a bit like that. Um, so I don't think it's a graphic. I, I'm not sure that any anybody will come up with something as memorable as Rudolf Zallinger did for Time Life. Um, I just have it in my head. Tend to think all the time, aerial images of flowing streams coming together and meeting, or possibly the the, the bush, the vegetation. Um, Good, wonderful question, though. Um, so. Uh... So Cheryl has the same question. Cheryl has the same question that I have. Um, Got to ask you this. But you were you have 50, 50 stories in this book. What would be the fifty first? Well, I think it's one that got dropped. Actually, <laughs> um, I, I I somewhat regret that we didn't do any stories based on the America in the Americas. You know, a rich. Uh, this is deliberate because, well, the, the Leahy Foundation has supported many important primate studies and. In, uh, in the Americas. But in general, we felt that um, w the, it, it was just a bridge too far to, to include them. Uh, but I wrote, a, I wrote a story. I wanted to have at least one dramatic story uh, set in the Americas. So I, I wrote one based around our a wonderful Nova that was done about the first Americans and uh, uh, a, a discovery in an underwater cave at a place called Oya Negra, one of the earliest of the first, of the, uh, the first Americans. Um, but you can't have everything. And uh, it was, uh, I, I'm profoundly grateful for the opportunity that this book presented to me. And it took a village to put it together. You know, this, the, um, Camilla herself, the Leakey Foundation team, I mean, there's Meredith Johnson, the brilliant producer of the podcast Origin Stories. Uh, several, several of my stories, I just had to go to the transcript, boom, the story was right there. Uh, so that's a tremendous source. I urge anybody that hasn't listened to Origin Stories to tune in right away. Um, the Science Executive Council, as I said, and also, you know, this this project, I have to say, just in thanking everybody, uh, one thing that made it possible was Nova's former executive producer, Paula Absel, who um, brought the project, who made me aware of this, that this project was a, a dream of Camilla's, and uh, made the whole thing possible. And my current colleagues at, at WGBH, who've tolerated me um, working on this alongside all my other Nova duties. So as I said, a whole lot of teamwork went into this. So uh, um, another question uh, that uh, uh, is that uh, if, if, if uh, from John Mead, if funding were no issue, right? You had all the money in the world. This is a question, by the way, I ask myself all the time. Which of the fifty stories that you 
that you uh, that you present in the book would you would you seek to expand upon with more updated research where, where would you plow your money um to 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 advance uh well, the stories that you're looking at well i i the writing of this book is sufficiently far behind me that i'm, I'm more focused on what's the next latest great thing and i just had a i had a tremendously exciting call um a couple of weeks ago with um Dr. Johannes Hale Selassie of the Institute of Human Origins about this extraordinary collaborative project that he and uh, the uh, the leaders of of uh, several other major research projects in the area of Hadar in Ethiopia are putting together, and that they hope it's a three year three year project that uh, is going to take uh, enlarge the focus of research beyond the single site to embrace an entire region the entire region of of uh of the stretch of of ethiopia uh to reach more definitive conclusions that are not they're now possible if you just look at one site or one fossil um i'm not answering the question but for, for me it's always over the next horizon is, is is the most exciting thing and this grabbed my imagination partly because the principal investigators that are collaborating in this unique project that's coming up are um, are mostly Ethiopian uh, from an Ethiopian background. Uh, one of them is uh, a Baldwin Fellow, um, uh, Haley Reda. I hope I got the name right, and uh, um, it, it includes uh, Zariah Lemzegev, famous paleontologist um, from uh, the University of Chicago. And this has been an intensely territorial field, right? Everybody was guard, tended to guard their discoveries. And for the first time, here is a big collaborative effort that's going forward that allows them to share, share their evidence. And it will lead to a bigger field of evidence becoming available. Yeah. Well, there's no question that, uh, that you know, science is, a, is fundamentally a collaborative endeavor. And the more exactly. collaborative we are, the, the, the better we do. And, and, uh, and, uh, and it's great to see those kinds of interactions occurring. I totally agree. Um, here's a question from, from Eve. Any guesses um, as to why those beleaguered little Dimonises, <laughs> I like to go and call that, would choose to continue living in a harsh and unwelcoming climate? What a wonderful question. I mean, uh, your, your imagination is, is as good as mine. I mean- People ask uh, the same that about, about, about those of us who live in New England sometimes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the science journalist Anne Gibbons writing about this in science. I was rereading her story, wonderful story about this today, and she imagines that the little the the little um, Dominices <laughs> poking their tiny heads into these hyena dens to try and grab a piece of uh, of of, of um, meat to scavenge a piece of meat that had been perhaps killed by one of these hyenas grabbing it and then running away. We know about these these little cat, little guys because they ended up in the hyena dens themselves. They were dinner for some of these fearsome predators. Um, I wouldn't have stuck around if I had to. If instead of going to the supermarket, I had to stick my head in a, a hyena den and, and grab it a bit of moldy meat. Would you, Dan? Oh well, you know, I mean, I've done some pretty crazy things out of <laughs> desperation. But you know, the thing is, you don't get to choose where you live. You you yes. you live where your ancestors were, and of course, it's not like humans. Like migrated, like in you know, uh, like some you know Cecil B. DeMille film, and just picked up and you know walked thousands of miles right. to another place. They, you know, they they dispersed slowly, slowly, generation by generation. The hominins expanded from Africa out of Africa, and they just happened by chance to be there. And what are you going to do about it? You can't get on a on a Greyhound bus and go somewhere else. So they have to make the best of what they had, where they were, with in the times they were. But uh, but it sure was not an easy time and place to live. That's for sure. Plus, the timescales are so vast, you know, that uh, uh, many of these, uh, this, this takes on, the, the migration of humans takes on the quality of a military campaign, you know, panzer divisions rolling across Europe. But in reality, it takes so long that you wouldn't be aware, probably, that you were necessarily, that you were, you know, expanding into new territory. You were just, you know... Uh, yeah, but it probably took you know from Africa to 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 the Caucasus, it took about a hundred thousand years. Which yeah, which which 
is this actually a staggeringly long time actually it seems yeah. like a blink of a time in ge geological but the blink of an eye geologically but but from from the perspective of individuals it's an incredibly yeah. long period of time yeah so here's an, another question from alejandro in your opinion what will be the future challenges opportunities and lines of study of human origins big question well that's that's uh it seems that i have a a, a, a bigger grasp of this sub, professional grasp of this subject than I than I think has come to me from writing these stories. What do you think, Dan? I mean, what what do you have a? It, well, I think um I think there's probably many answers to that. I mean, one of them right. to me is that um is the is that um you know the study of human evolution has really and human origins has really expanded from being a very specialized field into something that everybody studies now. You know. There's many yeah. people outside of anthropology departments as there are in anthropology departments addressing these questions. And that's really exciting because it means that, you know, studies of genomics and development and, and um, um, uh, are, 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 um, are, uh, are, are becoming more and more important. But, uh, uh, but the other sort of side of it is that uh, more and more the kinds of questions that we're asking about human origins are spilling into fields in, in terms of relevance. So, so one example would be evolutionary medicine. So how and why is the way in which we evolved and what we're adapted for relevant to treating and preventing disease? Um, so I think, um, I think that uh, we're entering an era where, in addition to studying what happened in human evolution and trying to understand that story, we're trying to figure out how to use that evidence and use that information to address the challenges our species face. And I think that's, I think that's really the the exciting future for this field. And, and one of the reasons why I enjoy being in the Leakey Foundation, because we get to help that happen. Here's another question from KD. Uh, you were the science editor of NOVA for many years. How can a scientist like me pursue a career in public television and or other media? Golly, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, the tools of production are now in everybody's hands in a way that was boy was never the case when I first got my you know my feet wet in in broadcasting you know uh, decades ago. Um, uh, the advice isn't simple, but I think writing and and storytelling, as I've tried to to say throughout this, is really fundamental, and you have to put your yourself in the position in the mind of somebody that is not a scientist that um, you have to relate this to that, that it's as if you're you're speaking to your your favorite aunt or <laughs> about your subject so you have to make the science um, simple you have to make it interesting by talking about the challenges that's that are involved um, there has to be a big idea <laughs> again we're back to these same principles but getting practice in writing for that type of a a, a public and putting it out there as a blog or as a, a video or uh, writing for uh, an existing um, an existing blog or getting your just getting your videos up on YouTube, um, I, I, the, as I said, the technology now um, it's both harder to to break in and you know get get a stable job doing this uh, communicating science. And at the same time, there's vastly more opportunity to uh, use, use the tools of production yourself to get a story across effectively. And boy, do we need it because, um, I mean, if the pandemic has taught us anything, yeah. it's that we really need to increase the public understanding of science. And, and that yeah. includes evolution. After all, the COVID pandemic that we are watching in front of us, uh, in front of our eyes, is, is an evolutionary story. It's a, exactly. It's a, it's the virus evolving, you know, on almost on a daily, weekly basis, which we're watching. And of course, and, right. it's, and it's and it's affecting us and it's interacting with our evolved biology. And and I can't think of a of a better um, of a sort of better sort of example right in our face right now for why why we need to teach people about about science in general, uh, including evolution. So there's a question from uh, from somebody here, super curious yeah. G. Uh, the research that I read suggests the opposite, that it's becoming easier to define human as there is less and less which separates us from other species. Well, there's a, a, whole, a whole ball of wax here in what constitutes 
species or not and you know were the neanderthals truly a separate species i mean we we thought for so long that we were superior to them and that we wiped them out in a you know, huge conquering wave as we spread out of africa you know 40,000 years ago and so the revelation in 2010 that there was um substantial episodes of interbreeding pr probably as we first spread out from africa somewhere in the middle east uh, this was revealed by the percentages of Neanderthal DNA in, in modern populations outside Africa. Um, and so th it, this was not a casual thing. And, th and there was both that interbreeding plus the revelation now increasingly that Neanderthals weren't these brutish people that they're depicted in popular media. But we now know that they may have done. They may have done some of the stencil hands that I saw in that cave with the set me off on this path. So are they really separate from us? Do they really, should they really be called Homo neanderthalensis? Or is it one, does Homo really embrace a multitude of, of other fl of flavors that we uh, are too quick to draw lines between? Well, I mean, if you ask 10, 10 biologists how to define species, you'll get maybe 11 answers. But, Fine. Um, but um, um, you know the idea that you can't interbreed with, with between species is that's an old idea that that obviously does not hold any water. I mean, yeah, you can graft oranges and lemons and produce something right. Like that's true. And, you know, camels and llamas and stuff like that. I mean, really, the the question is, uh, if there was interbreeding, how substantial was it, um, yeah. and how separate were the lineages? And I would say that the majority of us in our field still consider Neanderthals and modern humans separate species but i agree with you completely that the old idea of them as being nasty and brutish and and incompetent and uh, whatever has has uh, has fortunately uh, gone got well it's gone the way of the neanderthals actually but uh, but uh, not for the same reason so i have one last question um and because we do need to wrap up but uh, from emily the question is it seems like the more information we obtain the more complicated the answer is but how would you define human that's a John, great question to end on. That's a deeply philosophical question. I'm not sure I have a ready answer for it. I, I, I believe I am a human. The evidence suggests that I am a human being. And um, I'm not sure I can define what I am just now. Um, the essence of what I am may change after I have a beer right after this event. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I, that's, that was a very frivolous answer to a, uh, you know, a, a serious question. Um, but I'm ducking it again. So what do you think, Dan? Well, I think there, I think, um, I think you have to make distinction between humans as a species and yep. humans as a kind of more general concept. And I, I would, I, I use the term human for, for, for closely related species in the genus Homo. I think they're also, yeah. humans, but, um, they might, Neanderthals might be a different species, but I still think of them as humans. Um, yes, and, exactly. And yeah. I think we need to, um, you know, as you point out in the book, um, you know, we, we live in a very odd time when we're the only human on the planet. But but just like there are many species of squirrels and many species of gibbons and many species of you name it, there used to be, until very recently, many species of humans. And we live in this very strange and unusual time period when that's not the case. But uh, And we need to embrace the fact that we are, we are just one of many. Uh, we just happen to be... Um, just happen to be the stewards of this planet at the moment now and which brings a huge responsibility well we should finish up um and um once again i want to thank you for a delightful book for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it i recommend it it's highly uh, um, enlightening it's well written it has fabulous uh, illustrations and i think it's a fantastic introduction to what's really exciting about uh, going what's going on in in the field of human origins um both in terms of primatology, but also paleontology. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important contribution. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I should probably mention um, that, um, that uh, the recording of tonight's program is now available for replay at the Leakey Foundation Live and on our YouTube channel. And we hope you'll watch it again and share it with your friends. And we have a, shared a great link in the chat and video description to get a, to get uh, to purchase the book, Discovering Us, 50 to Great Discoveries in Human Origins Online. And of course, you can find it at your local bookstore. So thank you for watching. And we hope to see you 
at uh, some of these upcoming Leaky Foundation uh, programs soon. Thank you.